and as mentioned, today is a research to practice lecture. It's Head and Neck Cancer Management in North Carolina, Updates for 2020 with Siddharth Sheth, DO, MPH. So uh, we are going to uh, get to know him a little bit in just a minute here. Uh, Dr. Sheth, welcome. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for everyone for joining. Great. So, so let's see if we've got this information right. A medical oncologist and clinical and translational researcher, a member of the head and neck phase one disease groups at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, research focusing on the evaluation of novel therapies for patients with head and neck cancers in clinical trials, particularly focusing on novel immunotherapy and targeted therapies. Doing all right so far? Yep. Okay, good. And you participate in trials to improve treatment options for patients with rarer head and neck tumors, including salivary and thyroid malignancies. Translational science focuses on studying circulating tumor DNA, CT DNA, to evaluate the response to therapy and monitoring of disease recurrence. So what's something else we should know about you outside of that professional realm? Oh, uh... I'm sure my wife will like this, but I, uh, she's an interventional cardiologist, and um, she will be joining the UNC system in, in this summer. So after four years of long distance, she's moving down to North Carolina. Wow. Well, you must both be relieved, and, and congratulations to her. Thanks. All right. So uh, Poll Everywhere question, as you know, all of these are anonymous, and we try to give you a softball at the beginning, and I think this one definitely is. Which one of the following is not a cancer of the head and neck region? Uh, a, oral cavity, B, pharynx, C, spleen, or D, salivary glands? Uh, let me go ahead, and that one is activated, so you can go ahead and respond to that. While you're responding to that first poll, let me let you know that this activity has been planned and implemented under the sole supervision of the course directors in association with the UNC Office of Continuing Professional Development. William Wood, MD, MPH, and CPD staff have no relevant financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. Siddharth Sheth's DO, MPH, has no financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. All right, and uh, let's take a look at that poll. Let's show the responses. All right, so I, I think that our audience already has a pretty strong feeling about this uh, first poll question. Uh, how, how are they doing, Dr. Sheth? I actually can't see the answer. Oh, you can. The responses. Yep. Well, we um, and hopefully you'll be able to see the others. I'm not sure why that's not popping up there. We'll do our best to get that to you. But I will let you know that uh, we have a hundred percent on C, so on the screen. So, so I, th I think fantastic start. Okay, great. And uh, so, nice job to our audience. And uh, we'll go ahead and forward to the next slide. And head and neck cancer management in North Carolina updates for 2020. We'll turn it over to you, Dr. Sheth. All right, well, it's a real pleasure to be here today, and thank you for everyone for joining, and um, looking forward to spending the next hour talking about management updates for 2020. Next slide. No disclosures. So I really want to start off today's talk with a, a, a mental image, and historically, when folks think about head and neck cancer, this gentleman is typically the person who comes up, an older, an older uh, male who has a heavy history of smoking and drinking and uh, is diagnosed with head and neck cancer, typically pretty aggressive, and then ends up having uh, poor outcomes. So, um, yep. And what has really changed over the last decade or so is that now we're seeing healthier folks, um, and the demographics are younger males that are generally don't have a lot of other medical problems and are diagnosed with head and neck cancer and they end up doing very well. And so by the end of this talk, I really want you to be able to understand the risk factors that are different between these two patients and why one does worse than the other. So next slide. So we'll start off today with a case. So Ramsey T. Hill is a 55-year-old male who presents for a follow-up at your clinic. Uh, 
He initially saw him three weeks ago when he discovered a painless neck mass while shaving. He tells you that he's had on and off sore throat for the past two months, but thought it was related to his allergies. He denies any other symptoms, including pain with swallowing, shortness of breath, weight loss, nausea and vomiting. He remains very active. His past medical history is significant for asthma and well-controlled high blood pressure on lisinopril. Um, he has a five-pack year smoking history that he admits during college and stopped smoking in the 1980s. And he drinks about one to two drinks per week. He tells you that his family history is significant for breast cancer and his mother and sister. And he's a businessman. He travels around the country quite a bit, but does go to China one to two times per year for the last 10 years. So you do a physical exam. You see the same mass that he noted. You order a chest CT or a CT scan of his neck, and you find that it has a three centimeter mass. And based on that, you refer him to ENT, and they perform an endoscopic evaluation, and he has a one centimeter right tonsillar mass. They do an in-office ultrasound guided fine needle aspiration, and a few days later, the pathology returns positive for squamous cell carcinoma. And there's also a note saying additional diagnostic tests pending. So, and next slide. Oop. So, hmm. hey, were, you, were you ready for that, that question to come up yet? Yeah, ready for the question, sorry. So, uh, hmm. I can read off the question. Okay, and I, I'm happy to do that as well. So, so which of the, and uh, let's see, it looks like we may have a little bit of an issue today with Poll Everywhere uh, showing you the, the, what, what we want the audience to see. You're not seeing the responses, are you? I'm not. Okay, so I'll just communicate those to you. So which of the following is not a risk factor for head and neck cancer? And A is smoking, B is alcohol use, C is age, D is yearly travel to China, and E is HPV. And Dr. Sheth, uh, we'll wait a few more seconds and, and give our audience uh, just a few more seconds to respond. Again, for our, for our audience, this is all anonymous, and we really appreciate all the responses. So at this point, uh, Dr. Sheth, the lion's share are saying yearly travel to China, about 81%. We've got about 11% with age. Uh, and just a few percent with smoking and HPV. All right, so perfect. The majority is correct. So, next slide. Right. So, three major learning objectives for the talk today. The first is to understand the risk factors and uh, basic anatomy associated with head and neck cancer. The second is to distinguish the differences in the biology, prognosis, and treatment of HPV associated and HPV unassociated head and neck cancers, and then to really recognize and become familiar with key findings from head and neck clinical trials in the past two years. And as you'll see on the right, this is just kind of a roadmap of where the talk will go, so covering the last 20 years, and then really focusing on the last two years about the trials that come, and then ending our talk today with some of the novel clinical trials and translational work we're doing to improve therapies for the future. So first, some basic anatomy, everyone's favorite, and I do want to touch upon uh, pathology. So it's very important to note that 95% of head and neck cancers are squamous cell carcinoma. We do see other types of pathology, such as lymphomas, adenoid cystic carcinomas, adenocarcinomas, um, but again, the vast majority are going to be your squamous cell. And when we think about squamous cells, so these are the outer layer of your epidermis, and then they also um, line the mucosal membranes, and these are your moist tissues that line body cavities, such as your airways and your intestines. So when I talk to my patients about anatomical locations of head and neck cancers, I really break it down into five regions. I'll start with number five on the image to your right, which is salivary glands. And so your salivary glands are broken down into your major and minor glands, and when you break down Further, the major glands, that goes to the parotid, submandibular, and sublingual glands. And the reason I'm highlighting those first is because that's where you really see some of the other non-squamous pathology. Now, focusing back to one through four, so oral cavities from 
the opening of your mouth to the anterior two-thirds of your tongue. Um, the second is your pharynx, uh, and that's broken down into three uh, subparts. And the oropharynx, I think, is the, probably the most important anatomical location for this specific talk, and that includes both the posterior one-third of your tongue and also includes the um, tonsils. The next number, uh, next part is the nasopharynx, and again, so your nasopharynx essentially will connect your nasal cavity with your soft palate. And finally, your hypopharynx is just a small hollow tube that connects your, um, uh, your, your oropharynx with your larynx. And then, so the third section is going to be your larynx. That's also known as your voice box. And so that homes or houses your vocal cords, and it's an important space where air will pass through between your pharynx and your trachea. And then the final fourth one is your paranasal sinuses. So this is really four airflow spaces that are paired, and they surround your nasal cavity. And one important thing to note is that location can be and is definitely influenced by risk factors. So when we think about smoking-related cancers, often we'll see them with the oral cavity and in the larynx. And when we see um, HPV, which I'll discuss further, it's typically found in your oropharynx. So next slide. So next, some basic statistics and epidemiology. Much to a lot of people's surprise, head and neck cancer is fairly common around the world. So um, these are a couple years old, but as of 2018, there are about 850,000 new cases of head and neck cancer worldwide, and that accounts for about 12% of new cases of all cancers. And in terms of deaths, we have about 320,000 worldwide, accounting for 4.5%. In the U.S., it is a smaller rate overall, accounting for about 3% of all new cancers. And as of 2019, there are about 65,000 new cases and about 13 to 14,000 deaths. Maybe tobacco use and, um, sorry, last, last slide, uh, tobacco use and alcohol. And it's important to note that um, there is a synergistic effect if you use both of them. And the new kid on the block for the last 30 years has been HPV infection. And it's also good to know other risk factors. So um, Epstein-Barr virus or EBV is very common in East Asia, and that can affect your nasopharynx. In um, South Asia, we see betel nut ingestion, and you can see oral cavity cancers from that previous radiation therapy, older age, and males are more likely to get head and neck cancer too. And the last thing to point out on this slide is that as of 2020, the number of HPV associated cancers is most in head and neck um, cancer and has surpassed cervical cancer where traditionally we've thought about HPV associated disease. So next slide. So here is the TNM staging for head and neck cancer. It's complex. I don't want you to spend too much time thinking about it, but the few things to know is first, TNM stands for, the T will stand for your T stage, so how large is the size of your primary tumor. The N is, is there nodal involvement, and M stands for metastatic disease, so yes or no. And that first column in 2017 is the seventh edition of AJCC, which is the American Joint Commission on Cancer. And then a few years ago, they came out with two, um, the eighth edition in 2017. And what's really important to highlight is for the first time, um, they classified HPV-associated or pharyngeal cancers. And uh, one, this is a recognition that this is a true entity that exists. And the other important point is that compared to HPV-negative cancers, they really downstage. So what might be a stage three or four smoking-related head and neck cancer could now be stage one. So next slide. So another important point to um, know about head and neck cancers is the rate of which metastatic disease presents at initial presentation. So what I've done for you is listed common cancers, breast cancer, GI cancer, cervical cancer, lung cancer, pancreatic, and prostate. And what you'll see on this middle column is that such things like GI cancers, which is 25% metastatic at in initial presentation, and can go up to 50% with pancreatic cancer. So next slide. 
And this is really in sharp contrast to head and neck cancers where um, this was a study done in 2003 looking at the SEER database and it showed that despite the subsite of your head and neck cancer, there was really low rates of um, initial presentation with metastatic disease, so less than about less than 5%. And this is significant for clinicians, for clinical trialists and other researchers because this is an opportunity to really cure our patients who present with their head and neck cancer. So next slide. So just touching upon non-metastatic um, head and neck cancer, so again, accounting for 90 to 95%, you have 40% of these are early stage tumors, and these are really small primary tumors that can be removed either through surgery or with radiation therapy alone. And then 50% are of what we call locally advanced, so either large primary tumors or tumors that involve the lymph nodes. And despite our improvements in ther therapies offered, we still know that um, the prognosis is poor for patients who have locally advanced head and neck cancers, and overall survival has hovered around 50% for many decades now. And when we think about treatment options for locally advanced head and neck cancers, it's multimodality, so you could either do primary surgery followed by adjuvant therapy or postoperative radiation plus or minus chemotherapy, or if you choose if not to do surgery or if patient's inoperable, then you can do concurrent chemoradiation therapy. So next slide. So we're, now we're really going to talk about HPV-associated head and neck cancers. So next slide. So this was one of the um, important seminal studies that came out in 2011 in JCO, and this looked at um, the, the rate of increase of oropharynx cancers. So when you look at the figure on your left, you can see the x-axis is years, starting from the late 1980s to um, early 2000s, and your y-axis is a rate of um, new cancers per 100,000 uh, individuals. And so the first line is the yellow line, which looks at all oropharynx cases, and you can see that there was about a 30% increase. Um, and then when you break it down by HPV status, this is where it's interesting. So the uh, gray line is smoking-related or HPV-negative oropharynx cancers, and you can see that there has been about a 50% decrease. And conversely, when you look at HPV-associated cancers, there's been a relative explosion, so an increase in 225%. So next slide. So a natural question is then is what is HPV? Most of us know this stands for human papillomavirus. Around 80 to 90% of our us are exposed, mostly through um, sexual exposure. And when we think about HPV, so it's over 100 types have been uh, classified to date. Uh, I think what's really important to remember is that HPV-16 is the most um, oncogenic one that we see typically associated with head and neck cancers. We do see HPV-18, 31, and 33, but a lot less common. I think the other important thing to notice is, or to note is that HPV affects other sites. So as I mentioned, cervical cancer is very common. Vulvar, vaginal cancers are common. We all also can see HPV-associated anal cancers and HPV-associated penile cancers. And finally, uh, when we think about across the board all oropharyngeal squamous cells, about 60 to 70 percent of them you're going to see HPV-associated disease. So next slide. So this is probably the most basic science slide of this talk. I think it's important to note that there are two main viral oncoproteins that you should at least be familiar with, so E6 and E7. So E6 is a protein that inactivates P53. P53 is very important for mediating DNA damage and apoptosis. And then E7 is another oncoprotein that inactivates RB. And we know that RB uh, mediates cell cycle regulation. So when you have these two oncoproteins that are um, in, in activating these two pathways, it really leads to cell cycle deregulation and genomic instability, and that can lead to oncogenesis and formation of a tumor. We also know that when these two oncoproteins are in action, it can lead to an overexpression of E2F. And as you can see in this feedback loop, E2F, when it's unchecked, can lead to overexpression of P16. And the reason that P16 is important is now we're using its expression as a surrogate 
for HPV status when we look at tumor expression. And so there have been multiple studies that show that there's a strong correlation with P16 status and HPV status, um, about 80 to 90 percent. So next slide. So at UNC and most other places, we check for HPV status in two primary ways. So one is, look, again, looking at P16 through immunohistochemistry, and the other one is looking at uh, HPV through PCR-based testing. Uh, you can also do HPV by um, in situ hybridization, but that is less common. So next slide. <clears throat> So RTOG0129 um, was a really important study because it helped us strat risk stratify all oropharynx cancers. So what this study did was look at 266 patients that had oropharynx cancer, and we knew the size of the tumor, um, the HPV status, and the smoking history. So on the left side, you see 178 HPV positive. On the right side, you see 88 HPV negative. And then we further broke this, or it was further broken down by smoking status, so whether you smoked 10 pack years or less or more, and then further subclassified by um, the TNM stage. And what you can see is on the right side of this figure is that if you had a low stage or low risk cancer, so HPV positive with um, less than 10 year smoking history or greater than 10 year smoking history but small nodal involvement, you had very good outcomes, and that's represented by the blue lines at the top. Um, and conversely, if you had high-risk disease, so HPV negative, with heavy smoking histories, you were very high risk for having um, lower overall survival. And that you can see on the bottom, the three-year overall survival was 93% for low risk and 46% for high risk with intermediates falling in the middle. So then putting all this together, uh, sorry, next slide. When we think about HPV, it's very important for prognostication. So we know that the vast majority of our HPV-associated patients who walk through the door are going to be non-smokers and light drinkers. We know from both preclinical and clinical data that um, HPV-associated tumors are more likely to be responsive to chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And now HPV is a very well-validated independent predictor for improved overall survival. And regardless of what stage you present, if you do have HPV-associated disease, you're going to do better. So next slide. So now let's talk about treatment of HPV-associated diseases. So first off, it's important to know across the board standard of care, whether you're HPV positive or negative, if you decide to do concurrent chemoradiation therapy, the standard um, treatment is 70 gray, so seven weeks of radiation, plus uh, cisplatin is the chemotherapy agent of choice, which is either given weekly or bolus dosing, which means larger doses that are spread apart. But there's been um, a real big effort, both at UNC and internationally that we know that outcomes are better for HPV-associated cancers, so can we de-intensify treatment and still have great outcomes but reduce the amount of um, toxicity and morbidity from our treatment? So there have been many efforts, and this slide will kind of character summarize them and we'll go through in subsequent slides, but the first one is looking at de-intensification by giving a little bit more chemo up front but then doing less radiation out back. The second effort is can we substitute cisplatin with another agent, something called cetuximab, which is a targeted therapy, and can you use that in addition to standard of 70 gray radiation and have better improved outcomes compared to cisplatin, which can be very toxic, and we'll go through that study. The next um, kind of experience is looking at doing upfront surgery, and based on your risk factors, can you either completely take away your adjuvant therapy, or can you reduce the amount of radiation you get? And then finally, the, the last effort is a UNC effort, which will spend a decent amount of time, and probably one of the more aggressive ones, can we reduce both the amount of radiation therapy and the amount of cisplatin or chemo that we give? So next slide. So I think going back to that RTOG study I discussed and um, discussing this study, one of the questions that we should know and was answered was that are all HPV-associated head and neck cancers the same? So 
the study was a small phase two of 88 patients. And what they did was they gave neoadjuvant chemotherapy, so they gave three chemotherapies prior to doing radiation and chemo together. And what they looked for was how well did patients respond to um, neoadjuvant or induction therapy, and they did this both by manual exam and by endoscopic exam. So out of these 80 patients, 70% had what we call a complete response by clinical evaluation, and then um, you know about 20% had a partial uh, partial response, and then the remaining had no response. And so on that final box in the bottom, you can see what treatment was received. So if you had either a complete uh, response or a partial response, you received cetuximab with a lower dose of radiation. And if you had no response, you received full dose of radiation and cetuximab. So what were the outcomes? Next slide. Here you can see on that top line that irrespective of what your response to induction therapy was, uh, you did very well. And you can uh, next click. And so the the two-year progression-free survival was about 80% for all patients and a really excellent overall survival of 90%. So what was interesting, and next click, is that, um, and one more, sorry. So you can, what they did was they looked at all the patients that had um, the complete response clinically, and they looked at sub-characteristics. And what really came out was that patients who were smokers with greater than 10 pack years were more likely to have disease recurrence. So next slide. So the big takeaways from this, this study was one, risk factors matter. And when you really want to think about who are the lowest risk patients, it's HPV associated cancers and uh, individuals who smoke less than 10 pack years per year. So next slide. So next was a, an important start, two studies that came out um, last year and just published this year. One was RTOG 1016, which was done in the U.S., and the deescalate study that was done um, in Europe. And they asked the question, could you give cetuximab rather than cisplatin with full-dose radiation therapy? And the primary hypothesis is that the two would be equivalent. Uh, and, and what we saw was pretty interesting was that in fact, cetuximab was inferior in terms of overall survival in both studies uh, compared to cisplatin, and it also had uh, probably equal number of grade 3, 4 adverse events. So this was a major finding to show that cisplatin plus radiation remains the gold standard even for our patients who have uh, oropharynx cancer. So next slide. And, the, and I think no oncology talk is um, complete without talking about immunotherapy. So I'll briefly talk about a study that we just completed at UNC. Um, this was done in patients who had both HPV positive and negative disease. And we looked at if they were ineligible for cisplatin, we gave them radiation and immunotherapy with pembrolizumab. And we looked at their outcomes and their one-year progression-free survival was excellent at 80% and overall survival was 86%. And when you break this out by HPV status, which was about half of our patients, they had even better um, survival numbers. So this, again, is a small single-arm phase two study, but shows that there might be a role for immunotherapy that's just still down the line. And there are many other studies that are evaluating this. So next slide. So really the key takeaway, as I mentioned, was in patients with HPV-associated locally advanced head and neck cancer that are getting curative therapy, cisplatin plus radiation remains the standard of care. So next slide. Um, so what about treatment options with surgery? Uh, next slide. So this study was, um, you know, a small phase two done out of Mayo Clinic, and it really wasn't necessarily a surgery-focused study. It was talking about de-escalating radiation out back, but all patients, again, had uh, HPV-associated cancers, had less than 10-year pack year smoking histories, and they received upfront surgery, and then they were stratified based on the risk factors that we saw either clinically or based on their surgical pathology. And these, they were de-intensified based on the amount of radiation they received, so typically we would give them 60 gray, and here they received 30 gray or 36 gray. 
and even the chemotherapy was de-intensified, so not as uh, does ataxol at this dose is much less toxic than the normal cisplatin we give. And on the right, you can see that the two-year local regional control was fantastic at 96%, and overall survival, progression-free survival, were all very high as well. So this, too, would be a, a possible option for de-intensification. So next slide. So now we talk about surgery, and is it an option? So next click. So yes. Um, and so the surgery of choice is something called TORS, or transoral robotic surgery. So this is, um, TORS is different from conventional surgery because, again, it uses a robot. It's minimally invasive, so smaller incisions. It's less risky with less complications for bleeding and infection. And um, it's, it's a treatment modality that's used pretty widespread across the country. It's very institution dependent. So places like UPenn, for example, do a lot of TORS, where at UNC we do less. But next click. Um, so, one of the major studies that's being done currently is ECOG 3311. So unfortunately, we don't have data yet, but the study has been enrolling in one more click, sorry, that since 2015, and um, we're expecting the data to come back, come out either this month or in the next, by the summer. And what they did is that all patients received TORS up front, and based on their risk, they either, their low risk, they received no adjuvant therapy, their intermediate risk, they received a um, de-intensified radiation dose, and if they're high risk, they receive standard dosing. And this study will be really important to help us delineate if um, TORS and de-intensified de adjuvant therapy is an option. So next slide. And then finally, one more comparative and a, a very important study that came out in 2019 was the order study that compared radiation therapy versus TORS. And so this was um, a small study, only 68 patients, but randomized between the two groups. And um, what the primary hypothesis was is that getting TORS would have increased um, or decreased rates of dysphagia. And we know that with radiation therapy, dysphagia or trouble swallowing can be a long-term complication of the therapy. So the hypothesis is that if by doing TORS, we'd see patients have less dysphagia um, a year after their treatment ended. And what we can see, one more click, sorry, um, was that patients who received radiation therapy actually had superior swallowing-related outcomes. So they had decreased um, rates of dysphagia compared to TORS. Now, if you look at the numbers and they're kind of small, there were not clinically, um, there wasn't a clinical relevance between the difference, but uh, I think one of the major takeaways is that both radiation and TORS is a very reasonable option. So next slide. So key takeaway again is that both options should be um, give it to patients. I think there's certain nuances to when one should be offered versus the other, but they're both acceptable with good treatment outcomes, and um, more data should be coming to help delineate which might be superior versus the other. So next slide. I think, uh, so now we'll spend a few uh, minutes about how we treat HPV-associated head and neck cancers at UNC. So next slide. So Again, as I mentioned earlier, we've taken a very aggressive approach into de-intensification. Not only do we lower the dose of radiation therapy from 70 gray or seven weeks to 60 gray in six weeks, we've de um, decreased the dose of cisplatin by almost 25%, um, and also given it, rather than seven weeks, we're given for six weeks. So next slide. So what we've done is that this trial now using the same dosing regimen has had three different iterations. And so the first one just came out in uh, cancer in 2018 and showed really excellent outcomes. So three-year progression-free survival was 100% and overall survival was 95%. So next slide. So the second version was, again, same dosing, but included some higher risk patients, including those who smoked for greater than 10 pack year history. And you can see that 20% of the cohort um, fit into this category. So next slide. 
One of the important things that we saw with this data is that even if you were higher risk, your outcomes were still really excellent. So progression-free survival was 85% at two years, and overall survival was 95%. So next slide. So when we think about cancer ther therapeutic studies and looking at efficacy, we should also be thinking about quality of life and how treatment affects our patients. So um, in these studies, we also did a couple of quality of life um, surveys. And this first one uh, looked at overall, this dotted line at the top was looking at global quality of life. And as you can see, for the pre-treated patients, most patients were doing fairly well. It dipped a little bit during and after their treatment, but it came up nicely after um, 12 months and um, 24 months after the treatment. And similarly, when we look at specific symptoms like dry mouth, sticky saliva, and difficulty swallowing, they were not a big issue prior to treatment. It definitely went higher on treatment, but then started to come down um, six months, 12 months, and 24 months after treatment. So next slide. We used a different scale here. This is called ProCTCA, also looking at dry mouth and difficulty swallowing. It showed a very similar picture where pre-treatment wasn't a major issue. Dry mouth and swallowing difficulties peak on treatment in about three months after, and then nicely come down after treatment is completed. So next slide. So this was the, the paper that was published for um, NJCO for showing this data. So next slide. So I, we've gone through a world with the data. You say, okay, Sid, what do I do with all of this? So I think, you know, we have a lot of nice pieces, but not a full story. One of the major limitations of all these studies is that they're smaller phase two studies. We haven't seen a lot of randomized data. So really how will the, the field move forward? Next slide. Um, so, our TOG, our NRG, excuse me, is one of the large cooperative groups. So this is a consortium of many academic centers and community sites. And they're doing a phase two, um, three clinical trial that's going to be looking at comparing 70 gray of radiation therapy with cisplatin compared to 60 gray and lower doses of cisplatin like we're doing at UNC versus 60 gray and immunotherapy. And what this study will really show is, can we truly de-intensify our radiation and um, chemo doses, or maybe move straight to immunotherapy, and do we have equal or even better outcomes compared to our standard of care? And so this study, maybe when we do an update in 2025 or 2030, this will be one of the most important studies that comes out for um, treatment of HPV-associated or pharynx cancers. So next slide. So, and the final part of my talk is really doing a transition to biomarker strategies in head and neck cancer. So, next slide. One of the things I want to touch upon, you've probably heard it in um, some of the other studies that have come out in other cancer types, is looking at circulating tumor DNA. So, why is this important? So, when we look at, when we take tumor tissue, we do a lot of fancy molecular testing to see what mutations are involved and look at, uh, for example, pdl one expression to see if it's going to be more responsive to immunotherapy. So getting tumor each time can be really difficult. Tumors can be deep-seated deep or they can be, they're costly. Sometimes patients don't want to have them. So do we have other effective biomarkers that we can use to really look at the mutational and genomic landscape of our cancers without having to do repeat biopsies. And circulating tumor DNA is one of these promising options um, that's possible. And what's really unique is that there are, very, there are many ways we can look at CTDNA. We can look through the blood. We can look through urine. Some folks have looked through saliva. And so I think the important concept to remember is just like normal cells, tumor cells have a a certain amount of life, and at some point they're going to die. And when they die, they release their um, DNA that's specific to the tumor. And it's this DNA that we're hoping to detect um, in the blood and through other, other means. So next slide. So 
you know, our group at UNC has done a really fantastic job looking at circulating tumor HPV DNA as a biomarker for treatment response. And based on all the three clinical trials that have occurred, um, they've collected over 1,500 samples. And the real goal of looking at CTDNA is can we, one, guide therapeutic intensity based on these values, and two, are we able to use CTDNA as an early detection for cancer recurrence? So next sample, or next slide. So the first um, question is how to detect CTDNA. There are different ways to do it. At UNC, we've used something called droplet digital PCR. And over multiple iterations and with lab uh, laboratory collaborators, we've done a very good job of optimizing and analytically validating digital PCR for HPV-16 six, uh, DNA. And what we've been able to show is that it's um, very pre precise, so highly re reproducible. It's very linear, as you can see on the figure on the left, and it's very sensitive. So you just need a small amount of um, HPV uh, DNA in the blood to detect. So next slide. So the first question we had to ask ourselves is, is circulating tumor HPV DNA detectable? So there were three cohorts that were studied. The first one were healthy patients without cancer. The middle one were cancer patients who did not have HPV-associated disease. And the third was HPV-associated oropharynx cancer patients. And what we found was that when we measured in the blood for the first two groups, it had very high levels of no detection. So we weren't detecting CT, HPV DNA in the blood for these patients, which is good. And when we specifically look at the HPV-associated head and neck cancer patients, so it had great specificity, 98%, and fairly good sensitivity, around 90%. So you might ask, what about the 10% of patients you see at the, the bottom left that had no detectable CT, HPV DNA? And so we can postulate that maybe we just missed it, or maybe these patients were actually um, HPV negative or oropharynx cancer patients, and they were just uh, misclassified. So next slide. So the next question that we had to ask is, how can we look at CT HPV DNA, and are we able to use parameters of clearance to show if you clear better, do you have better outcomes? Are you less likely to have um, disease recurrence? So this study looked at that question specifically. So next slide. First, what we did was we, on the, the left bar graph, we broke patients down by their clinical risk. So you were either low risk if you were had less, 10, less than 10 pack year per history or small primary tumors, or you're high risk either greater than 10 pack per years or large primary tumors. And we define favorable or unfavorable based on the clearance profile. So we really looked at if you had a higher level of baseline copy numbers so greater than 200 per copies per ml, or if you were able to clear your CT HPV DNA within four weeks of treatment. And as you can see on the figure on the right, patients that had this favorable factors had excellent outcomes. So all 19 patients with favorable um, CT HPV, HPV DNA profile had no evidence of disease recurrence. And conversely, if you are high risk, um, you, and so high risk both clinically and based on your profile, you had very high rates of disease recurrence. And that was statistically significant. So next slide. And so this was a paper that was just published in JCO earlier this year. And next slide. So the last question and something that's really um, near and dear to me is, can we use CTHPV DNA um, relapse as a predictor for clinical recurrence? So this was, again, another study done at UNC. And it looked at patients that had no circulating HPV DNA detectable after their treatment and it looked at patients that had two positive CTHPV DNAs. And what we found is that if you did not have detectable um, CTDNA, your rate of clinical recurrence was zero, so you had 100% survival. But if you did have two detectable um, HPV DNAs, your recurrence-free survival was compromised. So next slide. <clears throat> 
So this is kind of breaking it down further into specific patients. So each line represents one patient. And what you can see is that uh, at time point zero, that is when either through clinical evaluation or radiographic evaluation, there is evidence of disease recurrence. And what was really fascinating and impressing, impressive about CTHPV DNA is that we were able to detect it earlier in the blood with a median lead time of 100 days um, before we were able to see clinical recurrence um, of, of, of cancer. So next slide. So this is one specific patient, just so you can really get granular about it. So on the left, this is a patient that had an HPV-associated locally advanced base of tongue cancer. And on the x-axis is days since treatment. On the y-axis is your CT-HPV DNA. So you can see initially they had about 5,000 copies per ml. It jumped up after receiving treatment and then went down to zero by the time treatment was done. And the, the first blip, it's a little bit hard to see when you did the post-treatment PET scan at three months, you could see there was no evidence of disease, so it was a complete response. And this correlated with the CT-HPV DNA, it was still at zero. Then when you did the next scan, which was a CT scan, again, there was no evidence of disease. But in this patient, we started to see a blip in the CT-HPV DNA. And we continued to see elevations, but it was only until about a year and a half later when a PET scan was done and there was evidence of metastatic disease in the bone. So again, this, could, this has the potential to be a really powerful tool to detect early recurrence. So next slide. So I think it's great if you can detect early, but you need to be able to do something about it. So this is now a, a trial concept that um, I'm helping to lead and that we're um, pitching to some of the pharma companies to say, if you have locally advanced treatment, if you receive definitive therapy, and then based on the detectability of your CTDNA, this study would allow us to do early intervention with either immunotherapy or targeted therapy, and we would look to compare outcomes. So can we see that there might be tumor recurrence over time, and by treating it early, do um, does, does outcomes improve? So next slide. So key takeaways for um, CTHPV DNA, number one, um, using for surveillance testing, it ha has a very high negative predictive value and positive predictive value. Um, number two, uh, this, there's a real opportunity uh, to decrease healthcare burden by using something like CTHPV DNA. So if we can validate it with prospective clinical trials, then perhaps maybe we need to depend less on imaging, which is very expensive. And third, can we act on um, positive CTHPV DNA? Uh, and so clinical trials are needed for that, and that's what I was alluding to in the last slide. So next. So what about CTDNA in HPV-negative patients? This is, um, I'll just kind of breeze through this very quickly. Next slide. This is, um, Another interest of mine, and so again, this is just a genomic landscape and common mutations that we're seeing in HPV-negative tumors. Um, I think, again, don't have to know this too much, but what's important is that we're, we're conducting a study where we can identify mutations based on analysis of the tumor and then looking to detect some of these mutations, specific mutations of the blood. So next slide. So this is LCCC 1835. Again, what I just mentioned, we're doing surgery up front, we're taking the tumor, we're doing DNA sequencing of it to identify what mutations are involved with the cancer. Based on that, we take those mutations and we're using drop digital PCR to um, detect those mutations within the blood. And then we're prospectively following that over time to see if we can see a change in the kinetics of the CTDNA with treatment. So next slide, which are just the aims of the study, um, but we can go through. Next slide. And so just to wrap up, so again, I hope you now recognize that our, um, this picture and this older gentleman had 
probably a smoking and drinking related cancer, bad outcomes, and now you know that HPV is a major driver for oropharynx cancers and folks who have this type of cancer are, um, are being able to treat, be treated with effective therapies and have great response and go back to their normal lives. So, next slide. You know, one of my hopes is that by using cross-functional research through basic science, translational, and clinical trials, can we shift the paradigm so in 2013, irrespective of what your risk factor is, are we able to improve our outcomes and uh, get everyone back to better health? So, next slide. So, let's get back to this case again. Just to touch upon, Ramsey's heel is a 55-year-old male. He has a newly diagnosed um, head and neck cancer that's, that we see pathology that's positive for squamous cell carcinoma. And next slide. And yes, yeah, so Ramsey's is asking you what causes cancer. So next slide. So bear with me for just a moment. I'm going to make a quick change so that uh, our audience and, and you as well are able to see those uh, questions. So we'll fix that and then we should be good to go here. All right, let me see. That said, if we're actually able to make that slide appear or not. And it's up. I think we've got it. Are you able to see it now, Dr. Sheth? I sure am, yeah. So, okay. yeah, so I think, well, 60% of, ooh, okay, we'll give it a second. Sure, and, and for the audience, in case you're on a small monitor, it's saying, what is the most likely risk factor for his head and neck cancer? Uh, remember, before we were asking what is not, and this time we're asking what is. A, smoking history. Uh, B, social alcohol use, C, age, D, yearly travel to China, or E, HPV. Okay, All right. so. Oh, go ahead. So perfect. I think about two thirds or um, three fourths if you got it right. It was HPV. Um, in terms of smoking history, yes, he did have a positive smoking history, but again, it was light smoking many years ago, almost three decades ago. So um, based on, on this information, it's the most probable risk factor is HPV. So next, next slide. So following a, following a negative CT chest, um, your patient is diagnosed with a locally advanced head and neck cancer and the stage is T1N1 N0. And what's the most likely? Yeah. Right. So again, uh, go ahead. Take take a few more seconds. Uh, sound sounds like they're on the right track. Correct. Yep. Great. So that HPV sixteen. Okay. Next question. Yep. Oh, let's see. There we go. Let's see, bear with us, we're having a little trouble with that. Um, all right, so based on the following options, what is the best treatment for his T1N1 HPV OP SCC? And that's what you're looking for, right? Yes. Okay, great. So, so A, observation with repeat CT scans in three months. B, vaccination with Gardasil. C, surgery followed by adjuvant ther chemotherapy. D, concurrent chemoradiation therapy or E, hospice. All right. So, so, so this was the... Oh, go ahead. Yeah. 
this was probably the trickiest question. Um, actually, D is the correct answer, and I'll just walk you through each one. So observation, he has a real cancer, so it needs to be intervened on. B, vaccination with Gardasil. We didn't talk about vaccination today, but that's really about preventing uh, HPV-associated cancers, but there's no data to suggest it can be used efficaciently for, um, for treatment. And C is actually wrong. It's tricky, but um, if you do surgery, you typically will follow it with radiation therapy, plus minus chemotherapy. So there's no real role for doing only adjuvant chemotherapy. So that's why C is wrong. And hospice, he's, he's a young patient with um, good risk factors, so should be getting definitive treatment. So the correct answer is concurrent chemoradiation therapy. All right, so just to wrap it up, uh, I hope I impressed upon you that head neck cancers are common and uh, HPV associated or pharynx cancers are rising in terms of incidence. Um, overall, the risk of HPV associated cancers is much lower compared to smoking. Uh, and I think by seeing all the different studies that there are great efforts to de-intensify treatment and it's really a matter of when, not if, will de-intensification become standard of care. The major question is just what's the best strategy. And the third point is really um, using biomarkers to help with cancer diagnostics, treatment, and surveillance. And so CTHPV DNA is already rolled out and it's received FDA testing and there's a commercial company that is testing for it. And so can, how can we use this to guide treatment decisions is going to be the next step. And then for our non-HPV folks, can we use um, the same treatment or the same evaluation through CTDNA to, to guide um, treatment uh, decisions? So next slide. So I have a lot of people to thank on the left are just the, um, the medical oncologists, radi radiation oncologists, and the head and neck surgeons at UNC. We have a really terrific group. Um, on the right are some of my research collaborators and our patients, and there are many other people who deserve to be on this slide, but um, so thank you to them too. So I'm happy to take questions. And we'll make uh, our question, oops, let me go back one, and we'll, but, but we are uh, just going to fix something here. There we go. And so we do have that question slide up. It's being elusive, but there it is. Um, hopefully it'll activate in just a second here, and I'm seeing these as well here. So uh, what is the availability of CT HPV DNA, DNA testing in North Carolina, and is it covered by insurance? Sure, great question. So there is a, a company that has now you know, started and paired with UNC. It's called Navaris. They're based out in Boston. And they're providing um, CTHPV DNA testing. And they've actually rolled out a new pilot program that will come to the patient's house and, and do testing for a small fee or can send you to a commercial lab or they can send the kits to individual centers. So um, it, it's for the first year or so should be overall free to the patients. And then over time, I think they're working how to build that to insurance. So, this is a, a treatment or an option that's going to become more commonplace. And if anyone's interested, I'm happy to, to refer them to how to get that testing. Great. Thank you. And are you able to see that next question there? Yeah. Um, is HPV latent and recurrent in gang? Uh, I'm not sure what the question is asking. Sorry. That's all right, and and you did post your your email there. So if if that uh, participant had uh, additional one wanted to follow up on that, that person would be able to. Well, we are at at two minutes past the hour, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, get us to our wrap up point here. Thank you all, our audience. Uh, we we can't thank you enough for being here today. I know these are very difficult times, and. Uh, we appreciate your tuning in. Um, of course, we want to thank Dr. Sheth. Dr. Sheth, this has been phenomenal. Thank you so much for this talk today. Uh, we want to thank the, the North Carolina General Assembly for their generous support.
of UCRF, that's the University Cancer Research Fund. We want to thank the UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. We want to thank Mary King, Veneranda Obore, and John Powell for all the hard work they do for this and every one of our lectures. Uh, you know where to find us, UNCCN at unc.edu, 919-445-1000. We're on the web, unccn.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, on YouTube, all over.